Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week we've got new shoes, more new shoes, and some other new shoes, plus the Bike Vault, your upgrades, and our main talking point, which is a continuation from last week's talking point on would you buy unbranded Chinese carbon? We're gonna read some of your comments, look at what you guys think, and also speak to someone who's got a lot of experience in buying these kinds of products. Also, I've put my bike in Biggie Smalls after all of you complained in the comments last week. So our main talking point this week, would you buy unbranded Chinese carbon? As I said last week, if this topic generated a lot of interest and comments and engagement from you guys, then we would you know, look at it further. And it definitely did. So we had a poll from last week and I said I'd read out the results. Uh, there 66% of you said you would buy an unbranded uh, Chinese carbon frame. 26% said no, and 8% said not sure. And I have to say, that result has surprised me. I didn't expect it to be as polarized as that. And if I'm honest, I thought it would be more in favor of not buying these kind of products. Um, so that's really interesting. Thanks to everyone that's voted on the app in that poll. And a lot of you commented as well. Now, unfortunately, I can't read out all the comments because there are so many, but I've you know, selected a bunch of them from sort of both sides of the argument. So Formula Will wrote, a friend of mine in my club purchased some wheels and he was impressed with the quality. The wheels were UCI approved in this instance. And that's something that wasn't discussed last week. And he said he thinks the emergence of these lower cost wheels has put competitive pressure on branded uh, manufacturers to lower their prices. He says he would consider a frame if it were UCI approved. I think that's a, you know, some good points there. I think putting pressure on, on the top end manufacturers to lower their prices, maybe that sort of you know, healthy uh, competition is part of what capitalist markets are all about. And you know, if it means that we get better uh, products, the consumer wins, so you know, that's, that's good. And also an interesting point about the UCI thing, if you are thinking of entering UCI events, then you will need UCI equipment. I mean, that's not something that usually applies to myself, but Anyway, <laughs> next comment is from Geordie D, who says, yes, simple as that. It's not a fraction, um, and you don't pay for all the other work, like painting the frame or installing little bits, you know, bearings and things on it, distribution and warranty costs, and that cost, he believes, can then be passed on to the consumer. But he does say, don't buy the cheapest ones. They're all fake, just like the cheapest everything else you can find on the internet. Yeah, some other good points there, I think, you know, it's sort of maybe you get what you pay for is, is sort of what you're, what you're saying. Charles James said, yes, I have in the past um, and I would again in the future. If you do your research and buy from a reputable company, you'll be fine. Well, that's, uh, yeah, good, good to know. Um, but it's not all good. And in the interest of balance, you know, I wanted to read out some of the other comments as well. So James Carl Photography, he wrote, a couple of my friends bought counterfeit frames a couple of years back. One was a knockoff Pinarello, the other a Cervelo. And from outward appearance, unless you had the genuine item directly next to it to compare, they were pretty convincing, but both broke within six months. Thankfully, one broke on a turbo trainer. Um, and he says internally, the layups were a total mess. That's, yeah, I mean, the thing to point out there is they were, you say, counterfeit frames, and we kind of established that counterfeit frames are absolutely just just steer clear of them, illegal, dodgy, bad products, but there are legitimate manufacturers out there as well. Uh, Michael uh, Galenci, sorry if I, Galenci, sorry if I've mispronounced that, I think, think I have, uh, says, I definitely wouldn't, I just won't take the risk. Um, but he would like to see us comparing some unbranded frames. We'll see what we can do in the future. Uh, Jochen Weidler says maybe he would consider it if an unbranded frame manufacturer started to support a cycling team. And yeah, I can see your point there. And don't, don't underestimate you know, that investment that a lot of big name brands put into the sport. It, you know, by having sponsors, that's what enables us to have things like the Tour de France. So, you know, it's, it's nice that they're part of that whole ecosystem. And, and also, it's a big endorsement having a top level athlete, you know, use that product to, to win a top level race. So, you know, at the highest level, it's, um, it's not something that I think should be ignored or disregarded. Vorname Naknami says, never again. I had one made by Tantan or Sephraf. It was very poor quality. The seat post was too small. It slipped down 
uh, into the frame. The dropouts weren't straight. The rear uh, brake mounting point had a big air inclusion and it failed because the headset bearings worked their way into the carbon sera tube. Maybe there are quality frames, but I don't want to test it again. I tried to build a bike for under a thousand euros and it failed, but at least the budget uh, sensor group set he bought uh, did work well in, in his experience. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's good to know. And yeah, thanks for that. I think the one thing I would point out is that although there were comments on both sides of the argument, and I've wanted to represent both sides of the argument here, most of the comments were actually positive uh, in people's experience, or well, most of the comments were people saying that they would want to try it out and buy it. Um, but a few comments uh, uh, were asking why we don't recommend a particular brand. Well, to be quite honest, we, I, we can't unless we've tried it and I've not tried any of these brands. So I'm not going to put my name next to it and say this is a good, good product because, well, I haven't tried it. But um, a lot of other comments suggested we get in contact with Trace Velo, as he is someone who's bought a lot of these products from manufacturers in China and tried them out and made videos about it on his YouTube channel. So, listening to your comments, I've done exactly that and I'm gonna talk to him now. Trace Velo, good to see you, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Bit of a milestone moment for my crummy little channel. Well, you, you know, you've had a lot of experience of buying these kind of components. So what experience, what components have, have you have you bought? So my basically my whole my whole bike setup here has manifested into this completely unbranded kind of bicycle. So I started off with the frame back in 2016 and just kind of went from there. And now the whole the whole setup, basically, apart from the bar tape, which is a lizard skin, uh, is is called all like unbranded so what the group set everything on well, there I mean, the, the group set is the group set's a recent upgrade to kind of well upgrade to a uh, an unbranded one i guess the wheels that i've got on here you could say that they're from a brand they're a kind of a budget more budget friendly brand called fastports um but every, everything else is kind of uh, is unbranded so with your experience of, of building that bike and, and buying all these you know mm. components what issues have you had? I mean, have they all worked perfectly? Yeah, so I was having to think about how to kind of frame this. Um, the vast majority of my experience with these parts has been positive. There have been a few categorically bad examples of things that I've bought. I've had pedals that have been a bit naff, uh, a pair of shoes, which I bought, which were absolute trash. Um, and what else have I had? Uh, the group set as well. The group set that I bought, um, a cheap one on AliExpress, one of the shifters recently failed me, but it's it, that's not really the right way to think about it because I, I didn't want to kind of put the narrative out there that buy, a, buy an unbranded frame and you'll be fine. Buy, a, buy a branded wheels and you'll be fine. You kind of have to take each part as its own kind of project, personally, if you see what I mean. And I guess it is that thing of you don't always know what, what you're getting is what, is what you're... Yeah, exactly. So we've, there are a couple of drawbacks. Um, First one is there's no warranty with the majority of these unbranded parts. So if something does does break or does bust, you've kind of got yourself to blame, I suppose. Um, yeah, there's no warranty. There are no instructions with any of these parts. So for example, I have absolutely zero torque specifications for any of the bolts on my bike. Um, what else have we got? Local bike shops uh, sometimes don't want to touch these either because there is no warranty and there are no technical specifications for them to work from. So local bike shops often try and avoid working on these. So items. what what advice would you give then to, to people that you know are, are interested in, in these kind of products? Yeah, that's a great question. So what advice would I would I offer? The advice I would offer is that often there's this notion that you can kind of just um, buy these unbranded parts and save a save a shed shed load of money. But like I said, there are those drawbacks, but one of the biggest things to be aware of is that the quality of these parts is not guaranteed. Like I said, I've had good experiences with the majority of them, but there are parts which are just garbage. And what I've often found, a pattern which occurs again and again, is that parts will often be, uh, they'll, they'll perform well out of the box, but then a couple of miles down the line, um, the, like slight issues will arise. So I've got um, other wheels here. These are a great example. So I bought these unbranded uh, Chinese carbon wheels here off eBay a few years back and they were fine out of the box. But uh, 
like six, 700 miles in, I had to retrew them. And I've had to retrew them on two occasions. And I've also had to kind of replace the bearings in them as well. Whereas with the kind of wheels I've got from a, a known brand, I've not had those issues with them. So you kind of, with these parts, you can save a lot of money, but in order to keep, keep these parts performing at like a really high level, you have to be willing to get your hands dirty and use a little bit of problem solving and a little bit of ingenuity to kind of keep them there. Well, thanks a lot for your time, man. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for sharing. You know what you've what you've experienced. Uh, thank you for having me on. Bit of a bit of a crazy moment for me. I'm not going to lie. So yeah, thank you so much. Well, hopefully you found uh, that interesting. I certainly did. And I think you know one of the big take home messages is you don't always know what what you're getting uh, when you buy unbranded carbon, and it can be a bit of a risk. While I'm aware that when you buy any product, whether it's a car, a fridge, a, a bike from, from a recognized brand, dodgy ones can come off the production line. There can be issues with quality control, and people do end up sometimes, in rare cases, with faulty products. But that's what the brand name is there for, um, and you know, warranties are in place there to protect the customer if that happens, because the brands want repeat business. It's in their interests to give you a product that works and create a good solid, reliable brand name for themselves. And ultimately, something I would love to do is, is to you know, see if quantitatively these unbranded products are you know, as good as, as the branded ones by getting a selection of them and comparing them next to a selection of you know, premium frames, putting them in some jigs and quantitatively measuring their stiffness, you know, cutting them open, getting a composites expert to analyze the carbon layups and things like that. But uh, yeah, something I'd, I'd love to do in the future, but I'll have to wait for another day, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I hope you found this interesting. And as ever, you know, get involved in the comments and let us know what you think about all this. It's time now for hot tech. And first up this week, we've got some new shoes from Japanese apparel brand Pedal Ed. So the Tokyo based company um, has released a new gravel specific shoe. Uh, to go with their existing gravel-specific clothing uh, line, which is called Yari, or is it Jarry? I'm not entirely sure uh, how to pronounce that, but uh, they do look really cool. So they've got this sort of navy uh, blue upper, which is really nice. And I love the way it contrasts with this kind of tan rubberized sole. So being a gravel specific shoe, they're designed to be walked in. And you may think that looks remarkably similar to the Physique Power Strap. Well, that's because it is. They've actually partnered with Physique to make these shoes. But whereas the Power Strap here is a road specific shoe, the Pedal Ed Yari shoe is gravel specific. So it's got this rubberized sole for walking in. Also has two bolt cleat uh, recess underneath rather than the three bolt road cleat uh, holes that are in uh, my power straps. But yeah, very nice looking shoes. And while on the subject of physique, the Italian brand as itself brought out a load of new stuff this week. So this is a new limited edition 2020 range that the Italian brand has produced and it uh, involves some of their most popular products. So you've got the Antares saddle, uh, which is Chris Froome's favorite saddle profile, incidentally. There's also the R1 Infinito shoes with the two bowa dials, their top of the range shoe, and some Vento bar tape as well. And all of these products feature a new kind of um, artistic abstraction uh, of the art of the breakaway in form of this white and black stripy pattern that goes across uh, all the designs. I think it looks really cool. I mean, I'm not, not sure I can see the, the, the abstract side of it, but I just think it looks really cool. Plus, they have uh, pink inner soles in the Infinito shoes, which I think look awesome. Mine don't have pink inner soles. I quite want a pair of pink inner soles, I think they're cool. They obviously help celebrate the Giro and stuff. But what do you think of the new Infinito R1s with the breakaway colour scheme on them, the black and white stripes? Let us know, we'll have a poll, hot or not, in the app. I know you guys love voting on a hot or not poll. Now I know you guys like voting hot or not in cycling shoes because last time we did a poll in the app for hot or not shoes, it was for these. The Nike Super Rep shoes. I've just got, a, just literally just got sent these from Nike. So they saw them in the show and decided to send over a set for us to have a look at. And I have to say, they look rather cool. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, 
Nike have developed this shoe as an indoor specific shoe. It's not intended to be ridden outdoors, but they know what they're doing. I mean, they're pretty legendary when it comes to making sports footwear. They've clearly identified a market there for the kind of spinning uh, market, I guess, is what it's for. Um, so the shoes have a Velcro closure. They're intended to be used but well there's a men's and a women's specific version the women's version is also available in this colorway but in addition it's available in one the men can't get which is this sort of fluoro pink which looks really awesome i kind of wish that was available in the men's one other details they have sort of rubberized soles so you can walk in them the sole itself isn't carbon it's just sort of plasticky it's not as uh, doesn't yeah it's not quite as stiff as a normal uh, dedicated outdoor cycling shoe i have to say i do think they look rather awesome but let us know in the comments you know what you think of these indoor specific shoes is it a thing or you know should you just get an outdoor shoe and use it indoors and outdoors but yeah let us know in the comments time has been sold to a startup company called what for now which appears if you go on their website to be focusing on e-bikes at the moment but according to an article written on bike rumor um, what for now actually has intentions to become this sort of conglomerate of um, you know great french cycling brands which well, I, I, if that can happen and become successful, that'd be a great thing. Um, and to be honest, you know, I just want to see time in good hands because I'm a big fan of how they weave their carbon frames. They make carbon frames in a really, you know, beautiful way that produces incredibly high quality frames that's different from a lot of other brands out there. In fact, I'd love to go to their factory and make a video on it and show you guys sometime. But uh, yeah, hopefully we can do that in the future. But that's all for Hot Tech this week. Time now for your upgrades. It's now time for Screw Around Upgrades by Upgrades, where you submit upgrades that you've made to cycling lives, bikes, anything cycling related really, for the chance to win the ultimate prize, a GCN cap or casket. And um, if you do win, let's hope it looks better on you than it does on me. I'm just, I just can't pull them off, but. I'm sure you will be able to. Before we move on to this week, let's take a look at last week's results. If you remember, we had Tom Warren's revamped Peugeot Cafe bike, and he was up against E.T. Kenny's Felt Build project. And with a whopping 76%, it was Tom Warren 30's revamped Peugeot Cafe bike. So well done, Tom. Send us your details on Facebook and we'll get the cap right out to you. Two cracking upgrades coming up this week. But the first one is in from Tomo Styles. This was my cousin's junior steel bike. We built two new wheels with versus brakes, removed the old paint to make it look new, removed the group set to make it a single speed. Nice. They bought a new fork um, because the old one was hooked, changed the tires from 18 millimeter to 32 millimeters. And the last two steps were to add the joker and a gold chain to make it fist bump approved. Nice work. The second upgrade this week is in from Timmy Two Bikes. This is an old 1982 Falcon Coxwell frame I bought on Gumprey for 40 pounds. 40 pounds for that, it's pretty good to be fair. I had it resprayed and Bob Jackson Cycles rebuilt it with the new SRAM Apex drivetrain, Shimano cantilevers, and a pair of used Mavic wheels. I think the bike before looks really nice. I like the steel color, and I really like the detailed handlebars with the Road Champion. I think they're really nice. Maybe we should have kept them on. Quite like them. But the after product is really nice. I think that's a really nice color paint job for the bike. Two really good upgrades this week, but it's not down to me, it's down to you guys. You guys need to get over to the GCN app and vote who's gonna win the cap this week. Head over to the app and get voting. It's now time for the bike vault when you submit pictures of your beautiful bikes and I vote if they're nice or super nice. And if they're super nice, they get put to the bike vault forever and ever and ever and bike vault bell gets run. If you do want to submit your bikes to the bike vault, you need to head over to the GCN app, put them in the bike vault section. All of us GCN presenters have uploaded our bikes where you can vote if our bikes are nice or super nice. 
Mine's obviously super nice. So remember that. So first up this week, we have Eric Andren Thoshenden, and he has sent in this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold the, hold the bell man on, because that appears to be an NM116 Panzer Jaeger light tank destroyer from the Norwegian army. First introduced in 1975, it saw service right up until the 90s. This one fitted with the 6V53T water-cooled turbocharged diesel power plant. Diesel power plants obviously perform much better in Arctic conditions than petrol ones, but I, I know you all, you all knew that. Owing to its light armour but high manoeuvrability, the NM116 Panzer Jaeger was intended in an ambush roll against would-be invading Soviets during the Cold War era. Uh, this one is clearly a, a later variant, which is obviously denoted by the uh, LV3 Simrad laser rangefinder fitted above the 90mm main armament. Yeah, super nice, super nice vehicle that. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks for that one, Ollie. Guess I'll move on to the next one. And this one is in from Peroni. And this is a beautiful picture. This is the Super 6 Evo High Mod Durace Di2 disc with a gold chain. We'll fist pump to that one. And we have tanned sidewalls on there. I can't remember what I said tanned sidewalls would be, but it needed something, so I'm gonna go with this tanned sidewalls. That looks very nice. Gold, the gold chain, the tan sidewalls, the gold Cannondale on the top tube, the gold bits on the tape, I think works really well with this. Everything's lined up nicely. I mean, I'm not sure how you could disagree with this one, but this is definitely a super nice for me, so. Next up, we have Will John Zero Two. I'm pretty sure this picture was taken in Singapore. And this is a Villier. Uh, 2014 Shimano Altegra. Uh, what is that? I think that on the fork is a light. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I think it's a light. Interesting. Never seen a light on the forks before, but makes sense. Mm, we could have taken the lights off for the picture and the bottle and whacked it in Biggie Smalls. That's a nice from me. Next up, Not the Boy. This is a Mercier Tour de France special from 1972. And it actually says in the description, this has been my classic ride for the past years and now I have to let it go and will miss it. I definitely do not think you should let go of this because that is absolutely stunning. I love the color, even though it's pink and I don't usually like pink, but I do like that. I mean, I'm, I'm not even gonna. 100% is super nice for me. The last bike in the bike vault this week is in from Sawyer Cole, and this is a specialised Roubaix Comp from 2016 with Shimano Di2. I just don't think the tree was the best background for this bike. I think it just doesn't do it justice. And I can see it's matte black, but I just, I need to be able to see more of the bike. We need a bit of a cleaner background. I just, so you could try again, maybe with a bit of a better background. Um, Obviously, Biggie Smalls valve line up, the cranks lined up, and maybe the bottle off as well, but just a few little things to work on for next time. Just don't stick your bike in a tree. So that's it for the bike vault this week. Remember to head over to the GCN app to submit your bike for the bike vault. Well, unfortunately, that's all for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show, and you know, get involved in the comments down below and also vote in the polls on the app and if you'd like to support what we do then well subscribe like all that jazz and if you know head over to the GCN shop you can get your hands on these awesome new uh, Castelli GCN caskets which also work as incredibly good sort of Covid hair coverings which is what I'm mainly using mine for at the moment. <laughs> yep still looking horrendous I'm starting to look like a you know, a baddie from Die Hard 1. Yep it's getting really, really long. So James this is the bike vault intervention, which I actually spent about 20 minutes trying to work out what this tank was on various like Google searches. <laughs> Time well, and then probably another 15 minutes like researching it. <laughs> and then probably like another 10 minutes learning what I'm about to say. Time well spent. <laughs> <laughs>